Once a famous giant, the largest ship of that time, now two grand pieces lying on the ocean bottom about 2,000 feet apart, torn by the catastrophic collision of time itself. The stern of the Titanic got completely ruined after hitting the ocean floor, but you can still recognize the bow since many interiors were left preserved. There's a type of bacteria found on the ship's rusticles. A rusticle is this brownish formation of rust. It occurs deep underwater when the wrought iron the ship is made of oxidizes. It means the bacteria eat the iron of the Titanic's hull piece by piece. And it seems they might finish their snack by 2030, way sooner than when anyone would expect the wreck to be gone forever. You may think it would probably be easier to take the wreck out of the water so that we got to keep it, but it would fall apart if anyone tried to do that. It's been in the water for more than 110 years now and is now so rusty that no one would be able to reconstruct some parts even if we managed to get the ship out of the ocean depths. What do you think? Could any of about 700 people that had survived the sinking of the Titanic hear it hit the ocean bottom? The largest ship that had ever been made till then disappeared literally before their eyes after all. But sound most likely wouldn't have traveled from water to air. We can't hear that well in water because our bodies are not designed to hear in such environments. And although passengers were close to the sinking site, the Titanic still hit the bottom a long distance away, 12,500 feet. There are so many underwater landslides and earthquakes we cannot hear, and they make way more noise than a single ship slamming into the ocean floor. Most vibrations and sounds must have dispersed over a large area. Also, the down blast of water, which many believe hit the Titanic after it had touched the bottom of the ocean, would have pushed back the majority of the potential acoustic vibrations. Plus, the bottom of the ocean is not hard enough to produce such loud noises. Many survivors said they had heard terrifying noises as the Titanic was breaking apart, but none mentioned hearing anything after the ship disappeared below the surface of the water. Some survivors shared how chaotic it was when passengers, mainly women and children, were getting into lifeboats. There weren't enough boats, and still, some of them weren't even filled to their full capacity. No one knew how to react properly in such a situation. The lifeboat drill had been scheduled for the morning before the Titanic hit the iceberg, but for some reason, it got cancelled. A giant ocean liner everyone believes is unsinkable takes a trip across the ocean. On its way, it strikes an iceberg and sinks. Yeah, we all know how the story goes. But what's scary is that it's also the plot of The Wreck of the Titan, a novel published in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic went to the ocean bottom or was even constructed. In the novel, the Titan, what a scarily accurate name too, didn't have enough life jackets, vests, and lifeboats for all the passengers on board. It was also the largest ship of that time, almost identical in size to the Titanic, and both the Titan and Titanic sank in April. Dorothy Gibson was an American silent film actress. She was also one of the Titanic passengers. She survived the catastrophe. Right after she came to New York, she started filming Saved from the Titanic. The film was released only one month after the ship sank. Dorothy was even wearing the same shoes and clothes she had worn when she had actually been on the ship. The movie was successful, but it got destroyed in a fire, so it only exists in memories, like Jack Dawson. Titanic wasn't all alone in the restless waves of the cold ocean near the iceberg it struck. The SS Californian was relatively close. Their radio was shut off for that night, though. At one moment, the crew members noticed mysterious lights in the sky. They immediately went to wake their captain up to tell him, but he issued no orders. Some believed it was just fireworks. They never realized it was actually a call for help. The flares, crew members of the Titanic sent off to the sky, hoping someone would notice. By the time the SS Californian got the SOS message, it was already too late. Some say a full moon may have been the reason the iceberg crossed paths with the gigantic ship. A full moon may have caused incredibly strong tides that eventually sent multiple icebergs southward, right when the Titanic was crossing that area.
If you watch the movie, you know the ship didn't plunge immediately after the icy doom had happened. The whole process lasted a good 2 hours and 40 minutes. But the situation was hard. There were 2,200 people to take care of, including crew and passengers. And things happening on the ship were chaotic. The chief designer, Thomas Andrews, soon realized they wouldn't be able to stay afloat. By midnight, the entire crew had begun preparing the lifeboats for launch. They had 20 boats with space for only 1,178 people, which was just a bit more than 50% of the people on board. The order was to get women and children to safety first. Crewmen were there to row and guide the boats. The scene over the next two hours gradually started escalating. The crew members had a task to wake up passengers and warn them something bad was happening. They wanted to place them into a fleet of lifeboats as soon as possible. At 12.15 a.m., some crew members sent out a distress signal. A steamship called Frankfurt was among the first ones that received the message and responded, but they were about 170 nautical miles away. Some other ships also got the message and offered their assistance, but sadly, they were too far away as well. At 12.20 a.m., the canard liner Carpathia got a distress signal from the Titanic and changed its course right away. They were 58 miles away at the time, and it would take them more than three hours to get there. 20 minutes later, the crew was lowering the first lifeboat. It was carrying only 27 passengers, although it had room for 65. Many of the lifeboats that were launched first were well below capacity. Crew members were worried, thinking the Davids wouldn't be able to hold a fully loaded lifeboat. And in the beginning, many passengers were just too afraid to leave the ship. They still thought Titanic was unsinkable and couldn't imagine the scenario that was going to happen one to two hours later. The crew was firing the first of eight distress rockets. Unsuccessful, no one was close enough to help. By 1.20 a.m., they lowered 10 lifeboats. Number 8 had only 28 people in it. One of the passengers on the number 10 was 9-week-old Melvina Dean. She would later become the last survivor who lived until 2009 and turned 97. It was 2 a.m. already. Three of the collapsible boats were the only lifeboats that remained on the ship. The bow of the vessel had sunk low and had tipped far under the surface. People around it could now clearly see stern propellers above the water. Crew members were lowering collapsible lifeboat D from the roof of the officers' quarters with over 20 passengers in it. As the ship's bow went under, the water was washing collapsible A from the deck. Those 20 people were struggling because their boat was partly filled with water. As crew members were trying to release collapsible B, it fell. Before they righted it, the water swept it off the ship. 30 passengers still managed to find safety on the overturned lifeboat. At 2.17 a.m., the ship's wireless operator decided to transmit one last distress call. A minute later, the light on the ship finally went out. Titanic and all left on board plunged into darkness. The bow continued to sink, and the stern was rising higher above the surface, which placed great strain on the midsection. Horrible sounds were filling the night. Titanic, this massive, legendary ship so many people placed their hopes in and were excited about, broke into two between the third and fourth funnels. Reports would speculate it took about six minutes for the bow section to reach the ocean bottom. The stern settled back in the water before it rose again into a vertical position. It remained in this situation until it finally disappeared into the ocean. At 2.20 a.m., the stern apparently retained air inside and water pressure crushed it as it went down. The stern landed about 2,000 feet away from the bow. People consider the Titanic the fastest ship in the world. They thought it was unsinkable because four of its compartments could be flooded and that still wouldn't cause a critical loss of buoyancy.
In 2012, a century after the wreck, new documents related to the scandalous lack of lifeboats were uncovered. It appears that a safety inspector named Maurice Clark proposed the addition of at least 10 more lifeboats five hours before the ship was supposed to set sail. But since the ship's owners clearly wanted to leave on time, his plea was overlooked. He was also warned that unless he kept this secret, he would be fired. In retrospect, had the owners followed his advice, an estimated 700 more people might have survived that night. The 20 lifeboats you counted, those that actually made it on board, could have carried only a third of the passengers, even at their full capacity. But tragically, some of them were launched with as few as 12 people when they could have easily saved up to 65 people each. To add to the disaster, the Titanic's crew members were not properly trained on using the lifeboat launching equipment. That's why the boats were launched slowly, improperly, and sometimes without the right supervision. Out of the 20 lifeboats, only 18 were set afloat correctly. Also, passengers were not informed about safety measures. A lifeboat drill should have taken place on the 14th of April, but the captain eventually canceled the event. One of the many myths surrounding the Titanic and its catastrophic ending is also related to the lack of the necessary number of lifeboats. There was no maritime law at the time that said women and children should get into lifeboats first. But it was a universally accepted custom in such types of situations as a shipwreck. Shortly after the Titanic had sunk in the icy Atlantic waters, rumors started to spread. It was said that some desperate men had resorted to dressing up as women in those final moments before midnight on April 14, 1912. They wanted to get a spot on the lifeboats and have a chance to save their lives. At the same time, there's little to no evidence that any of the male passengers of the Titanic had actually done this. In any case, what happened to those 20 lifeboats that were on board the Titanic after the ship hit the iceberg? What we do know is that all these boats were launched between 12.40 a.m. and 2.15 a.m., with a total of 718 people on board. By the time they were rescued by the RMS Carpathia at about 4 a.m. the same day, only 705 people had remained alive. It took the crew of the RMS Carpathia more than 4 hours and 30 minutes to pick up all the passengers and 13 of the lifeboats. This was as many as the rescue ship was allowed to carry. The rest of the now empty lifeboats were left adrift at sea. Those salvaged were later given back to the White Star Line, the British shipping company which operated the Titanic. Strangely, after being returned, they appeared to have vanished from official records. The last image ever taken of the 13 surviving lifeboats was of them getting unloaded in the New York Harbor. Sadly and ironically, that's where the Titanic was supposed to be on April 18, 1912. The lifeboats were then rid of their Titanic nameplates or any other markings that could have linked them to the ship. Some sources claim that the boats were eventually destroyed, but was this actually the truth? The fate of one particular lifeboat has been the source of much debate. Collapsible Boat A, the last one to leave the ship, was retrieved by the RMS Oceanic a month after the crash. At that time, it was a shocking 200 miles away from the spot where the Titanic had sunk. Also, in the boat, there was a wedding band engraved with the words Edward to Gerda, a sad omen to a couple that were lost at sea after managing to escape the sinking Titanic. Later identified as Edward and Gerda Lindell, the couple was traveling from Sweden to the U.S. to relocate. Some accounts claimed that Mr. Lindell did, in fact, make it to collapsible boat A. But his wife wasn't as lucky. Neither were ever seen again, and the wedding band was eventually sent to Gerda's father. The recovery of collapsible boat A was recorded in both photographs taken by the crew on board the RMS Oceanic and by a detailed handwritten account of a fellow passenger. They claimed that the lifeboat had looked more like a piece of wood carried by the waves than an actual boat. The first lifeboat to depart from the Titanic was lifeboat number seven. It was dubbed the millionaire lifeboat. It's rumored that the 12 passengers on board might have bribed the crew to row away to safety instead of allowing others to jump in. In 2015, some of the items recovered from this lifeboat, including a lunch menu, a ticket, and a letter from one of the passengers, were auctioned for up to $70,000 by a New York auctioneer. You know SOS, don't you? 
Three dots, three dashes, and three more dots. It's an easy enough signal to tap out in Morse code. It means save our souls or save our ship. The crew of the legendary Titanic had been desperately trying to send this signal for two hours the night of April 14, 1912. There were other ships not too far from the spot where the iceberg took down the mighty Titan of the Sea. But the call for help seemingly disappeared before it could reach them. The passenger ship SS Mount Temple did pick up a signal and try to respond, but the Titanic never got the answer. So what was silencing the ship's cries for help? Some unknown Bermuda Triangle of the North Atlantic? Consider this. Eyewitnesses say the sky was painted with a brilliant aurora borealis that cold, fateful night. Beautiful, yes. But on that day, the northern lights may have sealed Titanic's fate for good. You see, the aurora borealis forms thanks to geomagnetic storms. Sounds complicated, but those are basically fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic sphere. And what causes those is the sun itself. The magnetic sphere is like a protective bubble that surrounds our planet. It blocks harmful solar rays, winds, and other cosmic dangers from reaching us. Without it, life on our planet wouldn't be possible. Earth would look more like Mars. You also have it to thank for compasses pointing north. Experts know the Earth's magnetosphere affects navigational equipment, or disrupts it. Which brings us back to the Titanic. Recently, a published weather researcher named Mila Zenkova proposed a theory that solar flares, which provoked a geomagnetic storm, could have played a major role in the Titanic's untimely demise. Solar flares make themselves known on Earth all the time. Some people are especially sensitive to the magnetic storms they cause. These unlucky folks can feel weakness, fatigue, headaches, and even mood swings. On usual days, the pressure is the same on both sides. The magnetosphere blocks all the bad stuff, and we're all happy. But sometimes, explosions occur on the sun. They can be massive, Earth-sized. These flares shoot out a wave of charged particles that collides with the magnetosphere at high speeds. Our protective bubble then goes on the defense. It shrinks, deforms, and pushes those particles toward the poles. Enter those brilliant lights dancing above the Titanic that night. In the north, we know it as Aurora Borealis. In the south, Aurora Australis, or the Southern Lights. When the magnetosphere pushes those solar and cosmic particles toward the poles, they collide with molecules of different gases. That's why you get the range of colors. For example, oxygen can be green or red, depending on the distance, and nitrogen is blue or purple. What multiple people saw that night was exactly this phenomenon, including the second officer from the rescue ship Carpathia. He wrote it down in the logbook before getting the distress call from the Titanic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Auroras are a visible sign of a geomagnetic storm. Now, about navigational equipment. This applies to satellite and radio frequency devices. Remember, they didn't have iPhones back in the Titanic days, so the average person couldn't notice their gadgets going haywire. But navigational devices and wireless telegraph did exist and were actively used. Rewind back to the Middle Ages, when sailors noticed that, on some days, compasses wigged out. The arrows spun in all directions, and people back then had no idea why. It wasn't until the 18th century when French scientists found out that such problematic days occur at the same time as black spots appearing on the sun. Solar flares. The mystery was solved. Now, the Titanic had the most advanced, well-known radio equipment at that time. They tested it thoroughly to make sure it worked for distances up to 2,000 miles away. Titanic's passed them all. On April 10, 1912, the massive liner left Southampton and set off for New York. The very next day, the crew started getting the first reports of drifting icebergs and ice fields. They put dots on the map to mark the coordinates and let out a sigh of relief. All the troublesome spots were north of the Titanic's planned route. But after a couple of days, the warnings were moving farther and farther south, encroaching on the majestic ship. On April 14th, Captain Edward Smith decided to change course to the south in hopes of bypassing the ice. This ended up being a huge mistake. Enter the magnetic storm. 
If it was throwing the navigation equipment off, even by a tiny error of half a degree, the captain could have been mistakenly taking the ship right toward a cluster of icebergs. What's even worse, the radio operators ignored warnings coming from other ships. That, or they simply forgot to hand them over to the captain. As hired contractors from the radio company, they were more interested in transmitting paid telegrams from passengers on that luxurious liner. The radio transmitter kept going out of order that evening, probably because of all this private traffic. When it was finally fixed, operator Jack Phillips received another message from the SS Californian at 10.30 p.m. Their operator was trying to warn Phillips about the coordinates of drifting icebergs, but he paid them no attention. He was nervous and in a hurry. Was the magnetic storm to blame for his frayed nerves and bad mood? We can only speculate. But as you know, some people are more sensitive to these things. The weather was fine, the ocean was calm, the water was smooth as glass. Despite all the warnings, the ship continued to sail at a maximum speed of over 22 knots. An hour later, Titanic collided with the infamous iceberg. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.